So um, with having said that, and welcome to all of you, um, this is really a great day for us, and I'm happy to turn the podium over to Professor Wimmer, who will introduce General Zinni. Debbie? On behalf of the Health and Human Values Committee of the College of Nursing, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, General Anthony Zinni. General, I hope... I'd like to think that you got your start right here at Villanova. He's a graduate um, of Villanova in economics. General Zinni uh, joined the Marine Corps upon graduation from Villanova. He's held numerous command and staff assignments, including platoon, company, battalion, regimental uh, assignments. Uh, General Zinni has served his country long and well. His military service has taken him to over 70 countries, including deployments in the Mediterranean, the Caribbean, the Western Pacific, Northern Europe, Korea, including two tours in Vietnam. General Zinni's military awards include 23 personal awards, uh, including the Purple Heart for Vietnam. He also holds 37 unit service and campaign awards. His diplomatic experience includes presidential diplomatic missions, as well as mediation and negoti negotiation efforts. General Zinni is well known to uh, both the business world and the academia. He is presently president, CEO, and chairman of the board of BAE Systems. He has also has his own consulting business, working with companies in strategic planning, business development, and international marketing. General Zinni was the Terry Sanford Lecturer in Residence and Visiting Professor of Public Policy at Duke. He currently holds the Frank Rhodes Class of 56 Professorship at Cornell University. He's also lectured at numerous colleges and universities in the U.S. and abroad, and he's well known here at Villanova. General Zinni, as I said, holds a bachelor's degree in economics at Villanova, a master's degree in international relations at <coughs> Salo Regina College, a master's degree in business from Central Michigan University, honorary doctorates from Villanova, William and Mary, and the Marine Maritime <coughs> Academy. Uh, if that wasn't <coughs> enough, General Zinni has participated in numerous studies on subjects that include environmental security, defense, diplomacy, <coughs> genocide prevention, and leadership issues. He is the author of three books, all on the New York Times bestseller. Please welcome General Anthony. I want to thank uh, Debbie for that uh, great introduction. You know, they begin to sound like eulogies at this stage of life, so <laughs> I worry a little bit about them. But uh, good afternoon to all of you. Our friends from Amman, assalamu alaikum, you know, and uh, it's good to see all of you here. It's a country dear to my heart. I uh, spend a lot of time there, and it's, a, it's certainly a beautiful country, and I would recommend to all of you that have not been there that you should go. Uh, the subject has to do with the military involvement in humanitarian missions. And, and I want to talk a little bit first about my own personal experience. Uh, I've, I've been involved in three, maybe more, uh, humanitarian missions. One in the Philippines in disaster relief uh, after a typhoon had hit, and uh, one in, uh, in, in Somalia, uh, obviously after the uh, tragic events that happened with the violence there and the, and the, and the drought and the inability to get food, medicine, water and, and uh, things that sustain life to people out in the hinterlands and also into northern Iraq with the Kurds uh, and several others. Uh, I ended up when I commanded the Marine Expeditionary Force on the west coast with several missions from combatant commanders. Now for those of you who are not familiar with the way the US military is structured we break the world down into regions and we have commanders for regions that are involved in uh, U.S. military relations and U.S. military forces in those particular areas. There's a European command, a Pacific command, a Central command, Southern command. And the Central command and several other commands had tasked my Marine Expeditionary Force with handling the missions in those days that were called military operations other than war. And this was kind of a big basket of potential missions you could get, from disa immediate disaster relief to humanitarian assistance missions to peacekeeping missions. There were all the sorts of things that were 
other than the, the norm that we prepared and trained for, which is basically conventional warfare. And probably ever since uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, there's been a rise in these. I've been involved in a number on the African continent, in the Middle East, uh, in the Far East, and, and other places. As we got into these, we were thrown into these without really the kinds of things the military is used to have in, prep in preparation for, for missions. We didn't have really a doctrine for this. We didn't really understand how we would interface with others involved in the same mission. And in many times, although well-intentioned, the military was thrust into these missions, and we often found ourselves not understanding quite how we should apply the, the, the kinds of things that we could bring that would be of help, not understanding how we needed to coordinate with those on the ground uh, that probably had more expertise than we did in managing these situations. And so we've had, we had to learn a lot about this. And after the first sets of experiences and then with the taskings that we had in, in, in my uh, expeditionary force, we decided to develop a program of training in these other missions and much of it focused on humanitarian missions. We called this process of training Emerald Express. We gave it a name. And we invited in non-governmental organizations, uh, USAID, uh, international organizations, private volunteer organizations, and many other pieces and parts that we found on this kind of strange battlefield because we wanted to understand how to do it better and what our role should be and how we should coordinate and work with each other. And it was a great experience. We would, we would go through these sessions and, uh, each year and draw out of them what we needed in terms of understanding our tasks, developing our doctrine, and knowing what we should do. And it wasn't only the Marines doing this. Uh, the uh, U.S. Army's Peacekeeping Institute in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and a number of others had worked on this. And what would be obvious to all of you, there are certain component parts of the military that that focus on this even more so, our civil affairs units, our medical units, and many others. We found that these types of missions break down into several sort of specific kinds of missions. One is the disaster relief mission, and that's a, an out of the blue strike. It could be an earthquake, it could be a tsunami, a volcano blows up, and there's an immediate emergency and a need to respond. The second type is, is humanitarian assistance, where maybe it wasn't an immediate cause, but let's say there's been a drought, uh, hundreds of thousands of people are at risk, and, and there needs to be some sort of assistance to a traumatized population, uh, not caused by a one-stroke emergency, but something that's been chronic and developing. And the third type, and the one we found ourselves most, most in, is what we called complex humanitarian operations. And the complexity had to do with potential security requirements on the ground. In other words, there were bad people running around that may have been cause of the humanitarian disaster or certainly exacerbated the situation. If you look at Somalia now and the problems that are faced in, in the southern part of Somalia, uh, populations are really under stress due to the droughts and the, uh, the de desertification of, of the land, and it's compounded by the fact there are elements out there that are violent and will not let uh, aid shipments get through. As a matter of fact, my first tour of duty in Somalia, this is what we faced. The NGOs could not get the, the, the needed supplies out to where they were required because there were these gangs and warlords and things that would steal them uh, and disrupt the, uh, the co convoys and, and actually uh, perpetrate violence against them. Now, the, in, in each of these kinds of situations, they seem to unfold in phases. The first phase is the emergency phase. That's the need to get there, in there immediately and stabilize the traumatized population or those in need. The second phase is the recovery phase. And once you get past the initial uh, as, as stabilization, you have to now bring them back to uh, some kind of condition that allows them to go forward. And then the third phase is the sustainment phase, the ability to now put in place the kinds of things that will allow them to function either return to normal or help fix the problems that led to this and continue on. And the military has a role in each of these, but primarily our strength is in the first one, the emergency phase, the immediate response. And I want to talk a, a little bit about, you know, why that is. We're great in the short term because, first of all, we have a large capacity to do things. Uh, our logistics and our capacity to arrive on the scene and 
and, and, and almost overwhelm the situation with what we possess that might help is far greater than any other organization can provide. I remember being on the ground with the Kurds and uh, we had a United Nations worker and she was heading up the United Nations team and she came to me one time and she said, I have a request, I don't know if you can fill this and I hate to even ask, but is it possible to get six trucks? I said, six trucks? Give you 600 trucks. And she was overwhelmed and she was, it, 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 she was uh, Japanese, she was head of the UN mission and she was saying to me, you know, the scale at which you can do things is unheard of. We cannot even contract or muster this, you know, and she's done this all over the world. And, and so she immediately realized and appreciated the fact that we do things uh, pretty well on a big time scale. We also have other assets. I mentioned one, transportation. We can move things. We can move things by air. We can move things on the ground. We can move things by sea better than anybody else with, with the capacity that's involved. When, when we were uh, sent into northern Iraq and southern Turkey when the Kurds were uh, brutalized by Saddam and chased into hills, this was winter, it was freezing, 10,000 Kurds had died either through Saddam, Saddam's brutality or the weather, and they were finding themselves shivering and freezing in these mountains. They couldn't come down the other side because the Turks wouldn't let them down, and they were trapped up there. And we immediately went in, we were ordered within 36 hours from a dead start to have to start putting food, shelter, medicines, potable water on the ground for them in the middle of winter. 17 feet of snow in most of the mountain passes. And in 36 hours, we were delivering food. And in many places, there were no roads. And we put special forces teams into the camps to help manage them and run them and provide order. And we airdropped our supplies. We took riggers. These are people from all the services that build the pallets that we drop out of parachutes from uh, our planes. And we literally just uh, took stockpiles of MREs, medical supplies, operated out of bases in Turkey, and, and just flooded the hillsides with these supplies. And so that they could be provided by the pockets of, uh, of Kurds that were up in those hills. Our special forces teams, we had British Royal Marines and US Marines and others up in there that helped bring them back into the camps and take care of them. And so that's typical of the kinds of ways we can deliver pretty quickly. In addition to that, we have a tremendous uh, logistics network. We can provide food, shelter, water very quickly. Uh, what, what we did for the Kurds is we built camps and, and we put tents out very rapidly and we're able to get them uh, out of the elements and, and, and get them into some sort of uh, secure position so that they weren't left out in, in, in the cold at that point. And these camps could have been erected and were erected very quickly. We learned something interesting about that, just as an aside. When we first built the camps and brought the Kurds in, they said, we can't live here. And these were military camps. They were all aligned. You know, this was typical military order and alignment. And they said, this is not the way we live. You know, we, we, we more live, and they were showing us the design that they like best, and where best the, the, the heads in the latrines should go. It looked like Levittown to me, with little cul-de-sacs and everything else that they had. And we actually learned that uh, it was much easier then, and this was a first lesson, and I want to talk about it a little bit. We learned that when we called these camps and we used our military terminology, it kind of put them off and frightened people. So we decided to change some of the terminology. For example, there, we actually use their language. They, they, they live in the, the, the Kurdish terms for neighborhood and street. We use those things. You know, and, and, and so we, we tried to make it as comfortable and as familiar as possible. We carried those lessons over to Somalia. I remember in Somalia when we, when we first went in and we were doing the planning, and we had the, nations, uh, the forces from 26 nations coming in with us, and we were assigning out tactical areas of responsibility. You know, these were military terms. And we decided to change it. We called it humanitarian support zones. So we, we learned that if you, if, you, you, if you switch the terminology over, not that it changes the meaning for a soldier or Marine on the ground, but it begins to demonstrate what the mission's all about and how much you appreciate it. And that led us to a whole set of uh, terminology that we use in these types of operations. It not only sent the right message from those we're trying to help, it was easier to understand for those partners we had on the ground working with. And I think even for our own people, 
it sent a message about what we were trying to do there. We also provide tremendous amount of communications capability. And this communication, when we were operating in, in uh, southern Turkey and northern Iraq, this was the Judy Mountains, and they were very isolated. There was only one road that led from the port and airfield we were operating on, and that was about a 1,500-mile stretch of road to get in there, and that road was very difficult to traverse. And, and so the need to be able to have a distribution system that ran along that single road network and to communicate through it was critically important. And we brought in immediately 1,600 short tons of communications equipment and literally set up a communication network to all the places in the hills where we found Kurds and established camps before we brought them back home in, in, into uh, northern Iraq. And of course, the other thing we can provide very effectively is security. You know, we're good at that. We know how to do that. So if there is something that threatens people, we can uh, take care of the threat and make sure that they, are, they feel better uh, about where they are, less traumatized by having to worry about Saddam's forces or warlords or gangs or people that may prey on a traumatized population. And there has to be a lot of sensitivity as to how we do that. And we find mainly that's not only a job for soldiers, but we really like to see our own military police in the lead because the idea is to do this more like police than, than soldiers necessarily. We have organizations in, in the military that are designed to interact with other civilian groups and organizations that do humanitarian work, and this is our Civil Affairs Command. And our Civil Affairs Command establishes what we call a, a Civil Military Operations Center. And the Civil Military Operations Center is where we try to bring in all the civilian and government agencies working on the mission and coordinate with us in the, in the military so that we help and assist each other. Now, it becomes a very tricky business. I mean, you might think, if you haven't experienced this, that this is easy. Everybody would want to coordinate. But sometimes, some of the non-governmental organizations can't coordinate with you. It's not that maybe even they don't want to. Uh, they have to maintain neutrality in some cases, like uh, the Red Cross, the Red Crescent, and they can't be seen as working with a, a particular military. Some are faith-based organizations that really feel they have to stay separate. So how you communicate and coordinate becomes a little bit tricky with them. And you have to allow them a little distance, and you have to set up special ways to, to communicate and respect the fact that that's more difficult uh, uh, for them to be able uh, to work. Our civil affairs have trained more and more now on how to operate and coordinate in these environments. Originally, civil affairs was designed and still is designed to, to take care of the aftermath of, of combat and warfare. But now the aftermath doesn't occur after the battle, it occurs simultaneously. And so the need to interact even on a battlefield immediately with the traumatized uh, civil population means our civil affairs have, have, have had to learn to be well forward, set up, and able to operate just as you initiate any kind of, of military operations and they become expert on how to handle this. We also use our psychological operations units to help communicate to the people. Now, I would change the name if I could, because psychological operations can evoke all sorts of bad things in your head. But really what it's designed to do is provide information. One of the things we did in Somalia is we actually established a radio station and a newspaper and distributed it, it distributed it to ensure everybody was informed where to go to get assistance and aid, what's happening, dispel rumors, uh, especially if you have an adversary on the ground. In that case, we did have an adversary and that many of the warlords that did not want us there were, were trying to uh, propagandize the people and were spreading false rumors, so you needed a counter to deal with this. Uh, General Idid, if you remember him in the Somalia Times, he was I sort of had him in my portfolio. I had to go see him all the time. And we were constantly dealing with him in the confrontations we had. And probably the most irritable I ever saw him was, was our newspaper versus his newspaper, our radio station versus his. And we had, named, we had used the Somali name Hope for our radio station. And he hated it. And there's a word in Somali that sounds like trouble that's almost the same. And he was branding ours as trouble. And so we got into this war of words. 
And, uh, you know, because we did not want a war that, that, that was an exchange of kinetic energy and, and, and violence. And we were winning the war of words. And he was very upset about that. And he came to me and said, you know, we, you know, this is wrong. We can't be doing this. And I said, well, I got a deal for you. Lower your rhetoric and stop it and we'll lower ours. And he agreed. So sometimes the power of, of at least truth and, and, and the power of media and the power to provide information can prevent violence and can be as strong or stronger than the use of force in these places. So it provides a valuable ability uh, to do that in, in many ways. We obviously have regional co connections. I mentioned to you that our combatant commanders are established in the regions. When I commanded the U.S. Central Command, I knew the militaries in the region. I knew that at that time part of Africa was in our command, now there's an Africa command that's separate, and the Middle East and Central Asia. So when we brought coalitions in to work on this, I already knew the heads of the military, and, and, and we had operated and trained together before. So there's a commonality, there is a, an interoperability that we can bring, and it's always best to have a lot of flags in these kinds of operations and missions. First of all, regardless of what you bring to the table, how little it may be and what you can afford, it's still important to show those flags and so there's international and regional commitment to help people. It makes them feel better. And also, by the way, oftentimes you bring people in that are better equipped to deal with the population. If you're in a given region, forces from that region know the, the culture, know how to uh, interact with the people even better, and seeing their own militaries there sometimes helps build confidence and, and, and a stronger relationship. The side benefit of that with many militaries is to show them there are things they can do for their own people that go beyond just protection and security, and to teach them how they can be a bigger part of, of, of helping their lives in, in, in time of problems and, and trouble. We also have a very significant intelligence capability. Now, our intelligence capability was originally designed to understand the enemy, the order of battle. But it rapidly can be converted to understand whatever the problem is and the cause is to be able to provide intelligence on that kind of cause. So we understand what's going on and how, it, and, and how, it's, uh, uh, how we can best remedy it. So our intelligence can quickly turn over to environmental intelligence or intelligence uh, if, if there's a man-made cause or problem to focus on that. And we can share that intelligence, which is a critically important, especially with our coalition partners. Obviously, for the majority of you out here, we bring tremendous medical capability to the scene. Sometimes too much. Uh, when I was uh, uh, up with the Kurds and we had effectively moved them back into northern Iraq and we had a string of camps we built before they actually went home, we had a number of medical facilities, military medical facilities coming in. And I think almost every country on the planet at that stage wanted to send a military medical field hospital. And northern Iraq had such great medical care that we had people driving up from Baghdad with their health records to come to our medical care. You know, uh, we had GYOBN uh, uh, GY clinics, we had uh, elective surgery going on in some of these places. I would go out and visit them. I was in a Belgian hospital and I asked them what they were doing. They were doing some elective surgery, I think it was plastic surgery, on some poor guy out in the middle of nowhere. And of course, the doctors without borders and the others were there were just screaming, saying, you can't sustain this, you know, you're, the level of expectation and what you're doing. And so sometimes what's well-intentioned could be way over the mark. And we have to be very careful with that. It's difficult sometimes to coordinate the need. And, and I'll give you an example. We, we were over a large area in northern Iraq and Kurdistan, stretching from the Iranian border all the way over to the Turkish border, along the Turkish border to the Syrian border. And we needed to have medical facilities all along that border as we brought people back down. Uh, what the UN termed breadcrumbs, to bring them out of the hills but care for them at each way station because they couldn't quite come down directly because it was very difficult for the population. Well, as we needed these, we now needed it and had the ability to have a mix of military medical and, and NGOs and other civilian medical uh, support. But many of the NGOs did not want to be told where to go and where to set up. Uh, and, and they resented that. So we had to let them pick their places first and then use the military to fill in behind them. 
Uh, and, and, and that worked effect effectively because we were very flexible at doing that, as many of you know or will find out. Uh, our, our medical capability is very expeditionary and can operate in very austere in, in environments uh, if necessary. We also have a tremendous engineer capability. I mentioned the, the, the camps, but obviously we can bring to bear, I know we have a CB in the audience and uh, you know CBs, heavy engineers and, and others that uh, we can do unbelievable work. So if you are involved in things where that kind of construction is needed, where the ability to provide facilities is needed, uh, if you're involved in earthquake areas where you have to move a lot of debris or, or, or help in, in reconstruction, the engineering capability of the military is, you know, really doesn't have a, a peer in what we, we can do. We also set up magnificent distribution systems. And so we can lay out the kind of distribution systems necessary to provide support and supplies like a spoken and, uh, 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 hubs kind of system that allows us to reach out and service a great area. Uh, we have teams that can set up small bases operating as spokes off bigger bases that make, me, make sure we can get into every nook and cranny. If you looked at that area in Somalia that we were responsible for, it was the size of the state of Texas. And if you went out toward, you know, from the, the sea inland, you went through some really desolate country, almost desert, all the way to the Ethiopian border. And out there we were able to set going from the ports and airfields of Mogadishu and some of the other smaller ports along the coast, we were able to set up a network of support and supply that reached all the way out to the border regions, into the most remote regions to, to provide all the support necessary for them to operate. At the end of that, or at the start of that, if you will, are the ports and airfields, and we can manage those well. We know how to run ports and airfields extremely well. Sometimes it gets a little bit testy because there are all sorts of people that want to use limited facilities, ports and airfields, and somebody has to prioritize it. And that oftentimes, be, oftentimes creates a little bit of friction out there. When we were operating in northern Iraq with the Kurds, we had one major airfield initially. And the priority for us was food, medicine, potable water off that airfield. And there's what we call the MOG, maximum on ground. You can only take so many aircraft on the ground at a time. And so we had to, in some ways, prioritize who could come in and land. And obviously, military aircraft are equipped to come in and disgorge their contents very quickly. We palletize them. We can move them quickly. We have the, uh, the material handling equipment to do it. But oftentimes, we would get well-meaning civilian aircraft, not coordinated, flying in, unpalletized gear, so it requires longer time on the ground for them, which prevents other aircraft from coming in. And sometimes they get very upset when you don't have their particular supply provisions as a priority. In the early stages of the game, we had uh, Philip Morris deliver a plane load of sweaters out of the blue. And we weren't into the sweater phase yet. We were still into the feed and Medicaid uh, phase. And we had to tell them, and their sweaters were not palletized. So we just had a plane full of sweaters donated by well-meaning people back here to give the cigarette company a better image out there. You know, and, and we had to turn them away. And obviously that creates problems. As a matter of fact, I saw them on one of the talk shows really indignant about the way they were treated by the U.S. military when they attempted to deliver their, their goods. We also provide mortuary services. We understand how to do that, and that's necessary. And, and when I say mortuary service, it's not just a matter of, of handling remains, but when you're dealing in these kinds of environments, it, it, it's sometimes difficult to identify. So you have to be sure you understand how to handle the, 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 these remains with the same dignity as we would handle our own casualties, but also the obligation to work with the United Nations and others on identification, if there's a need to inter them on the scene to mark those and make sure we report and, and, and catalog those. In the case of the Kurds, we had this problem. You know, as I said, we had 10,000 people that, were, that either died or were killed in, that, in, in, in those events. And our ability to, to find those remains, we, as a matter of fact, the French unit that was with us, the French Marines and the French paratroopers, their mission was to run along the trails and road networks actually looking for those remains so that we could recover them and account for them and work with the UN Commissioner 
the High Commissioner for Refugees on the process that, that internationally we respect and, and the UN provides for. We also do something else that goes to that next phase, beyond the emergency phase. We know how to contract. And uh, there comes a point in time when you move out of that emergency phase and you want to move into the recovery phase and eventually in the sustainment phase. And so you want to find a way locally to get things done. The military is a very expensive way to do this business. It's necessary usually in the emergency phase, but it's more costly. We were feeding Kurds at $5 a Kurd per day when we, were, when we were doing it through military means. When we contracted to get it done through the Turks and others, we dropped it to a dollar a day. And the advantage of that, too, was, there was several fold. One, instead of MREs, which I don't recommend for anybody, even a starving Kurd, you know, was that we now went over to the kinds of foodstuffs we could contract for that they were used to, more familiar with, and, and much more in line with her dietary uh, uh, traditions. And secondly, we now, because of the contracting, we're able to get you know, some, uh, some businesses functioning, put money into the local economy, much cheaper for us, and now you're moving more toward the sustainment and, and more toward the stability. So we look quickly to move into those kinds of phases. And sometimes we do the contracting and we understand how to do it, and sometimes we'll pass those contracts over to USAID or to international NGOs or agencies or others that can do the same thing. But as rapidly as we can find those resources locally, it makes sense uh, to use them and bring, it, bring them in. We provide, as I said, rations and we also purify water. We have uh, 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 re re reverse osmosis purification units, row poos, which can turn uh, uh, the worst water in the world into something potable. As a matter of fact, my Ropu unit took me down one time in the middle of Egypt and laid out about 15 types of bottled water, many of which you may recognize the names, and they, w they showed me how they test water uh, in order to prove to me their water was of the highest quality. I was shocked at how some of these things come out in those tests. <laughs> You know, because we were using bottled water at that point until we had the Ropu units uh, come in and be able to do it. Now, what are the disadvantages to the military and things you need to watch for? We are not a long-term solution to a problem. The military is going to try to recover itself and get back and be ready for its, it, it, its really central missions. And so there's a lot of stress and pressure to get the military out as reasonably quick as you can and turn it over to somebody uh, else. It's also, as I said before, very expensive. It's an expensive solution. And you pay for it. The, every taxpayer pays for it, too. And you have to move over to things that sustain but are obviously less costly. We are not the experts. Despite the fact we may do a lot of this, we don't know more about medical care and sustainment in these situations than the doctors without borders. Or we don't know enough about uh, the nutritional uh, imp the importance and value of the kinds of, uh, of rations and things that should be provided over the long term. And we really rely on, uh, on other expertise, either from our Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, who often send out what's called disaster assistance response teams with us, or from the NGOs, the United Nations, and others working with us to provide that. And oftentimes, our thinking we are expert can lead in, uh, into problems, because what may seem uh, to be intuitional and, and right may not be on the ground. And again, you have to think longer terms into sustainment and your ability to make sure that you can sustain whatever you're putting on the ground. We also have a problem sometimes with acceptability. And sometimes a military uniform is not acceptable on the ground or it raises suspicion or it causes anxiety and not just amongst those that you're trying to help. But there is, a, there is an issue, as I mentioned before, with cooperation with the other agencies on the ground. And, and as I said, some of this has to do because they have to maintain neutrality or they have a, 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 a faith-based system that doesn't allow them to, to work with the military. And secondly, there, there becomes a resentment sometime that the credit is going to go to the military. Believe me, when the military arrives, we don't only arrive with soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, and coasties. We arrive with the media embedded. 
And the good story is, you know, the Lance Corporals and the privates are doing this wonderful job, which they are. And many times these non-governmental organizations, this is their life. They've been in hell holes around the world doing this. They might have even been on the ground before you, as was in the case in Somalia, for years. They just got into a position because of the security uh, problems that they couldn't do their mission. And you suddenly come in and you get the press. And that could cause resentment. And so you have to be very sensitive to that and ensure that you, you don't sub unconsciously push them aside or unconsciously not give them the lead. You know, you have to support them. And you have to try to allow them to do what they do under your umbrella and find wherever you can to be supportive of their efforts instead of trying to replace their efforts unless there's an emergency. And that's a tricky business and it becomes part of the problem. Many of those NGOs and others have a better cultural awareness that we may have of a particular region or a culture that we're operating in. And it's important for us to understand those cultural, uh, uh, that cultural sensitivity. As a matter of fact, the captain with great experience in Afghanistan, we were talking about this before. Uh, the ability to treat and, and become involved with, with women in certain cultures has to be done by women on our side. And we were talking about the, the missions that, that she was on, working with our combat forces right up front and going into the villages and doing this with not women's uh, me medical uh, staff, and also in some cases where we've trained women uh, to go along with our, uh, our, their male counterparts to handle all the interaction with women. So you need that kind of, you learn those kind of cultural, cultural sensitivities, and you've got to try to work to develop the capabilities within your own forces to be able to do this. So coordination and cooperation becomes an issue, the clash of cultures that you could have, uh, the requirement for joint planning. I mentioned at the start that in, in the Emerald Express efforts that we did in training was to try to build a coordination network. We interacted with um, an organization that, that is called Interaction. It is the association of non-governmental organizations in the United States, but also can reach out to other international and private groups. And we brought them into our training exercises, into our doctrine development to say, tell us how we best coordinate and, and work with you. And how do we develop common concepts on, on the way we operate? How do we, should we best share information? We found in some cases, for example, in Somalia, that security was a big issue. And for some NGOs, they could work directly with us, so they would tell us we need to bring resources out to a particular area. And we would say, fine, we'll give you the security to take you out there. Other NGOs that I mentioned couldn't have that kind of direct co uh, coordination. So th they would just inform us where they were going to be, and we would just happen to maybe clear that road and be flying overhead while they were on the way. So there are ways to work around it in, in, in many ways that where it isn't direct coordination and it isn't seen that way, but we ensure the kinds of things we could provide are, are supportive for what they do. We also have to watch political sensitivities in, in, in these environments too. Uh, I know, for example, we are providing a lot of supplies, and relief supplies in Pakistan, and they cannot have, you, you know, uh, from the United States on them. I mean, there's a sensitivity to that. So they're, they're provided to the Pakistani military to distribute without identification of the source. And there's some political rationale behind that and, and other sensitivities behind that. And in many times, that's okay. I mean, that's okay with us. In many times, it's to your advantage to make the local military look good too, or the local NGOs, or the lo local humanitarian workers that are out there. Another issue we confront is funding for these missions. There is nothing in the Department of Defense budget that is, uh, that is predetermined to go toward these kinds of missions. So whenever a mission like this comes up, and the President of the United States decides our military will respond, there's going to have to be, like military operations, a supplemental. There is going to have to be approved by the Congress uh, a, a, a budgeting and funds for these operations. That, that, and these funds will not have been planned for in any way. Sometimes, you know, it's a zero-sum game in budgeting, and if the supplementals are approved, or even if they're not approved, it'll eventually come out of the hide of the military budget. You know, and, and in some cases that's well and good and it's fine. In some cases, 
It depends on where it comes from and what it can, it can hurt you. And obviously, military missions like this detract from primary missions in terms of you lose training time, uh, you're off on doing other, other things. I found most of the military people, or the vast majority, if not all, love these missions. I mean, what I found is the, is, is the soldiers and Marines and sailors and airmen that are involved in these missions really embrace them. I have a collection of pictures and slides from uh, every one of these missions I've been on. And it would, uh, it would really touch your heart to see how they immerse themselves in these problems and issues and, and, and want to resolve them. And sometimes, uh, they get so emotionally in, involved in, in what happens, it becomes difficult for them to detach themselves from that in, in the end. We've worked very hard to pull all this together. And I would say now, from the first missions that I went on like this to where we are now, it has become much better. We understand the roles, we understand the nature of the kinds of things we're getting into much better. We have developed a coordination mechanism that is much better, not perfect, but certainly well better. We become familiar each, with each other on these battlefields, you know, whether it's the you know, civilian organizations, our own governmental organizations, international NGO or whatever. And so it's much improved in the, in the way we respond. I had a friend of mine who was uh, to take out the mercy to the tsunami relief, the, the hospital ship. Uh, he was a retired admiral. He was being called back. He was a, a doctor in the Navy. And he called me up and he said, what's your advice? And I told him, I said, when you arrive, you will be past that emergency phase. So don't go out there with the idea you're going to be rushing ashore and treating trauma victims. I said, if, if it were up to me, the mercy would be bringing metal, medical equipment and medical personnel who could help train local medical personnel. In other words, you are now into the recovery, moving into the sustainment phase by the time you get there. So gear it to that and not the emergency phase. You know, and, and so we've learned enough to understand where you are in the course of these. The last thing I would leave you with is I was working with the um, Organization of American States on disaster relief in our own southern hemisphere, which is a big problem in many countries, you know, south of our borders. And one of the things, when, when they asked me to look at the kinds of problems they were having and the disasters they they, that struck there, what hit me right away is these disasters, whether they're hurricanes or uh, earthquakes or volcanic eruptions, happen in the same place over and over again. And what they do in that sustainment phase, right after the recovery phase, they just reestablish what was there before. And either you're on a place you shouldn't be, because it's in a floodplain with mudslides and it's going to happen again, or you are not building to a kind of code that's going to resist the, the, the major ca catastrophe you're headed for. And so there's almost a fourth phase I became convinced in, in working with them. And that is to look at whether you're in a place where repetitive disasters occur and doing an examination if you've created a situation or you're going to repeat a situation that makes you vulnerable. So it's almost the fourth phase of analysis that has to come uh, into this and, 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 and to be put into the consideration of, of reconstruction or reestablishment uh, or, or some sort of, of adjustment where you can make it. I think these kinds of problems are going to continue. I think we have some major environmental issues that are going to hit us with the climate change and the things we face now. And I think we're going to see much more involvement of our military into these, these kinds of missions. We're working toward becoming better at these sorts of things. Our responses are much quicker now. We know how we fit and we coordinate better. But we can always do better also. So that's a little bit of a cross section of sort of how we evolved maybe over the last two decades and what's becoming an ever growing mission, how we fit and how we embrace the missions. And I'm certainly glad to take any questions or comments that you might have on this. And Thank you for coming today, too. Questions? Yes, sir.
while being in the Middle East and the Africa, face the issue of losing your aid, your food, and my specific example is the vaccines. Did I get a perception of some people that these vaccines would be harmful to them or the way to kill them, concerned for the aid of them? Yes. You know, uh, rarely, but we do. we do. We have faced that. As a matter of fact, I was talking to a military doctor the other day that was really troubled because a young girl was brought to him in this situation, and she had a, an injury to her leg, and there was, it was, there was at her foot, and there was gangrene setting in. And he realized that she had to go to a major facility, and, and, prob and, and an amputation was going to be necessary. And when they presented that to the parents, the parents said no, and walked away with the little girl. And he was so upset and felt that we ought to go get that little girl, even take him away from the parents, and had to be told to back off. And, and so it is rare, but it does happen, where sometimes the vaccination is, is, is scary. And that's why I said that if you can find an interface into the culture, it's extremely important to be able to, to, to help you uh, at least communicate the need and the necessity. But sometimes it, you know, it hurts your heart to see that you, you can't follow through uh, on, on that. We do. We do. In Somalia, for example, we had uh, three Arab countries that, that provided forces to help support us, and we had a total of probably six, seven Muslim countries involved. And it's not just in, in terms of, of that kind of connection on the humanitarian side, because some of the security missions we had to do were sensitive. We had, uh, we had a report there were weapons in a mosque. And we had a U.S. team that had surrounded the mosque and said they, they had this report and they needed to search it. Obviously, with people that you know, were very resistant to this. And so I had to call and I said, look, just stay there and wait. And we flew down a contingent from one of the Muslim forces to do the actual searching of the mosque. And the, uh, the local mullah said to us when, when we did this, he said, if you would go through all that trouble to do this, I have no problem with you coming in. I mean, what he was looking for was respect for the religious place and the willingness to, to, to take that consideration and to do that. So it becomes important not, uh, on the cultural interface on many levels, not just in terms of the humanitarian explain what you do, not just in the interface I mentioned before that women should deal with women or other sensitivities that particular cultures might have, but sometimes it laps over into other areas like security too. What is the best? unit to be put in a certain place rather than maybe putting a unit in that doesn't fit. And, and, and sometimes the cultural problem is amongst the coalition forces too. I mean, I've had Greeks and Turks together under my command. I've had Pakistanis and Indians together under the command. And you have to be a little bit sensitive to that. I always like to get Italians because of great food and kitchen. <laughs> Any others? Yes, sir. Yeah, and you, you don't know what you have out there. And, and the best way I've seen this managed is to ask the United Nations to come in and establish a humanitarian operations center and let them vet these organizations as best you can, as, as best they can. In Somalia, we had a HOC, a humanitarian operations center, and actually the president of CARE came in to manage it and run it in the name of the United Nations. And so the, the non-governmental organizations we dealt with, we trusted would be vetted through them in some way and be able to. 
And some of those NGOs may not be acceptable on the ground, even though it's not a, a vetting issue or a funding issue or, or where they're provided. So rather than get into that business, it's to quickly get on the ground somebody like that. Now, in our own American system, I mentioned that the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance quickly deploys what's called, what are called DART teams, Disaster Assistance Response Teams. And these are experts in, 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 in this area. Uh, and these experts uh, can help you with that, too, in managing that, identifying it, working with the hawk in order to make sure that we don't run into a problem like that, because that's going to taint the entire structure in the organization that, uh, that you're involved with in, in some way. Uh, we did a, a humanitarian mission to the former Soviet Union as a gesture of goodwill when the wall came down. And, and we, we intended to, and we did empty all the wartime stocks we had prepared for the Cold War in Germany and elsewhere, uh, the medical supplies the, and, and hospital supplies and other things that, you know, would, would work. And we flew them into the former 12 republics of the Soviet Union to give them to the orphanages and other places. And we used the DART team as an advance team to figure out where best to send those and provide those. Because you don't want to do something that embarrasses a particular government, even though it's well-intentioned, that goes to the right place and in the most need. So they can help in that respect, too. Thank you. Others? Yes, sir. Yeah. I was involved in a number of studies in, in Washington to, to, to move toward what, what's now being called smart power. Hard power being the military, use of the military in the military role, soft power being uh, development, diplomacy, uh, aid, and that sort of thing. And, 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 and what came up, and, and the phrase was coined, smart power, the right balance of the two. And obviously, there are places where more soft power is more, more effective in the long run. Or if there's a need for hard power, military intervention in some ways, you very quickly move to the sort soft power reinforcement. Uh, I went to Iraq at the request of Ambassador, uh, 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 the ambassador there and, and, and General Odierno a couple of years ago to do an assessment. And what I found when I went into the, uh, every morning would sit in in the, in the morning brief for General Odierno at the coalition headquarters, the number of things that were non-military that the military was doing at that time. And I actually said to him, Ray, if I closed my eyes, I wouldn't know it was in a military operations center. They were, ma they were helping manage the date palm harvest and the provision of pesticides. They were uh, opening recreational swimming pools, managing the zoo and the museums. Uh, they were working with uh, the tribal leaders and ethnic and religious leaders to, to, to settle differences. They had a negotiation or mediation cell they were working. They were working on the electricity grid to get it up to 24 hours uh, power. And I can go on and on into these things they were doing. They ranged from simple things like the recreational swimming pools. And when I asked him about it, he said, well, nobody's doing this and it has to be done. And more and more we're finding that, yeah, we can provide security in a neighborhood and a bunch of soldiers running around in full combat gear, but that doesn't make the people really feel life is back to normal. It may give them a temporary sense of security but it still makes them feel like they're in a war zone. And so what can we do to actually make them feel life is coming back to normality and, and that it looks, it, it obviously gives them a better impression as to who we are. Another story, when we first arrived in, in uh, uh, Somalia and we had to go out and secure the area that we were going out to, actually I had a meeting on the first day with General Adid. And General Adid said, I'm gonna give you a piece of advice. All those people you see out there are used to seeing a lot of men with guns. And despite the fact you're going to tell them you're different, they just see you as another group with guns. And he said, if you go out there, go out with food and medicine and water to show you're different. And so before we even started to stretch out uh, to the entire area, we asked a number of the NGOs and others to come with us. And we had uh, some of our people from you know, what amounted to the embassy that, that had been there to go with it. So the first thing the village leader saw, beside all the Marines that were there, they saw one of our diplomats and quickly saw NGOs in the village with medical, food, and other things. Uh, and, and that softens the image 
of what you're out there because you have to do for security reasons. So those are the kinds of lessons you learn. So the SEAL that told you that, I think, really has an appreciation for, you know, the limitations on what you may have to do in a security sense to what you need to do in the long term to bring a traumatized population, you know, back to a sense that, that life has returned to normal. Yes, yes ma'am. Well, as I was telling the group today at lunch, I mean, you, you, if you talk to any soldier or Marine that, that's been in combat and either been, a, as, as I have, been wounded on a battlefield or have seen their friends wounded, uh, the corpsman or the medic is your, is your best friend, extremely valuable. They're precious to you. They mean a lot to you. Uh, and and uh, to watch how they operate and what they do is significant. And these kinds of environments we're talking about now they could mean everything because you have right with you with the first squads that, that, that come into contact with the people, you have somebody that can reach out and do something positive for individuals. And I can't tell you uh, how many times I've been down to the forward edge of these kinds of missions and watching our corpsmen and medics out there uh, really involved and, to and totally engaged in providing support and, and help for people. In the most unusual situations, watching a, 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 a corpsman treat a little girl bitten by a black mamba in, uh, in Africa, to watching a corpsman working with young kids that had, had just had the traumatic amputations. And, and, and these are the corpsmen, you know, in the front that do this sort of thing, and the medics in, in front doing this sort of thing. And I think the squad around them, when they see this, appreciate not only this is what happens for them if something should happen, and this skill level is so critical to their well-being and their buddy's well-being, but they begin to see they're an extension of this. That squad entering that village, like I said in the answer to, uh, uh, to John's question, it's not just you're there for pure security purposes. You've, bought, you've brought in an inherent capability to touch the people in a positive way with what that corpsman can do out of his uh, medical bag that he has or, uh, or she has now, in many cases uh, with them, uh, enabled to provide something positive out there. But for all of us that have been on battlefields, my life was saved by a corpsman on a battlefield, and, and after he saved my life, he jumped up and went through a hail of fire to save other Marines' lives. Uh, these are people that are very special to us and close to our heart. Well, I want to thank you all. Oh, you had another question? Okay. You know, th th that's a great question because I'll tell you why. We had some criticism about uh, taking soldiers and Marines that are geared to fight the nation's battles and now involving them th uh, in this. And there were people that says you may be taking an edge away from them that they need in combat that they need to be trained. And that is absolute rubbish. They they know when to turn it on and they know when to turn it off. And, and they are actually better judges than that than generals are right up front. Uh, when I was in Somalia the first time, we had the troops come back to us and say, sir, the only option we have is this M16. And a lot of the situations we confront, we'd like to, security situations, we'd like to handle with something that isn't lethal. And so we actually went out and looked for non-lethal capability. We ended, every, ended up with everything from sticky foam to rubber bullets and all this other stuff. And we asked for it because the troops asked for it. You wouldn't believe the heat we took from back here, that now we got Marines with rubber bullets and sticky foam, and we're going to confuse them as to when to use it or not use it. And I actually had 60 Minutes come out to my command, Steve Croft, and he talked about this criticism. 
And I said, Steve, here's what I'll do. I said, we had a, a company of Marines that had been out there. I said, I'm taking every NCO, staff NCO, and officer out of the, co the company. You just have the Lance Corporals, the PFCs, and the privates. You go under that tree, and you ask them, you know, if somehow we handicap them. So he went and talked to them off to the side. He came back, and I said, what did they tell you? He said, they told me they know when to shoot, and they know when not to shoot, and, and they don't need anybody to tell them. And so he said, I'm convinced. It disappointed me in a way, because... He wanted to be sticky foamed, and I really wanted to sticky foam him, but he decided not to in, in the time. So, you know, uh, you know our, our Marines, soldiers, sailors, airmen, they know when to do it and when not to do it. You know, and, and, and there is no doubt in my mind that they can do it. Just one little anecdote. Uh, we were in, in, in Mogadishu, and outside the gate of the old burnout embassy where we had set up our, our command post, that every day there would be what looked like a riot. You know, they would come out there and demonstrate and scream and yell and everything else. And we had one Marine out on the, uh, on the gate. And I had a reporter come up to me and he said, you know, he said, I went up to that Marine, I looked at that crowd and I said, they look like they're ready to come through that gate, do something violent. And he said, I watched that Marine and he never flinched. He stood there and he said, I finally went up to him and said, Marine, weren't you afraid? Didn't you think something was gonna happen? He said, no, sir, I looked in their eyes and I knew they weren't going to take me on. So, you know, they are pretty much savvy in what they do out there. And they know into which pocket to reach on how to remedy a situation. And we, we have created a magnificent all-volunteer force that are pretty bright and understanding. And in the vast majority of cases, they know how to do the right thing. And, and, and I think it's our obligation to give them the tools to do it all from soft power to hard power when it's necessary. And, and, and to trust them and to train them and educate them on when to make the judgment to do the right thing too. Thank you very much.